She's one of India's best-known authors, yet we know very little about her. Millions have read her essays on the Narmada and the bomb, yet few have understood what these subjects really mean to her. So what is the reality behind this enigma? What sort of personality lies behind the author? Let's see if we can catch a glimpse of it as we meet Arundhati Roy. Arundhati, your writings don't convey a single clear idea of their author. Instead, what one has is a series of complex, sometimes even contradictory images. Would you agree with that? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I, I know that, you know, there is a difference between fiction and non-fiction, which may be perceived by some as being schizophrenic or a, a different personality writing. But that isn't the case. It's just a different means of, of really talking about a philosophy. So okay, let me, let, me, let me see if I can ex understand that philosophy. In The God of Small Things, one forms the impression of the author as someone who takes an almost childlike wonder and delight in the lesser things of creation. I, I would always sort of say that The God of Small Things, it, it isn't just about the small things. It's about how the very smallest thing connects to the very biggest. In yeah. fact, it makes that connection between life as well, from the small to the big life, yeah. in fact, the truth of existence. Yeah, you know, uh, from the dent that the spider makes when its eggs hatch on the water and Esopin and Rahil are watching, to, you know, what they feel as unprotected children in this very closed parochial community, to how history it intrudes into their lives. You know, uh, okay, that, that, and that's self-complete in itself. And then on the other side, you have your activist writings, your essays on the bomb, your essays on the Narmada. And there the image is of a woman struggling against the world, almost at times a lone voice in the wilderness. Well, uh, it, it isn't a lone voice. You know, I think the saddest thing about this is that one in the nuclear essay, as well as in the Narmada, uh, I'm taking up issues that are not new. I'm only restating them, you know, and that, that I think is something that, that has to constantly be done. But you're doing it in the teeth of public convention. You're doing yeah. it against the graft and grain of wisdom. I don't know about that, you know. I think what we have begun to define as public is a very small, privileged public, you know, but in the case, you take the case of the Narmada Valley or what's happening. One is really uh, trying to make the connection between this very well-informed or supposedly well-informed public and a world that's slowly being cut off. You know? Okay, I want to talk first about the person making this connection and then let's talk about the subject okay. they connect with. Let's go back to the beginning. You were born or you were at least christened, I believe, Susanna Arundhati Roy. When and why did you stop using Susanna? <laughs> when and why? Um, I just, you know, I just don't like Susanna, I, I guess. You know, it's just something that um, sits uneasily on me. How old were you when you made this decision? How old was I? I think even when I was in college, people used to call me Susie. A lot of people did, but um, I'm the, I, I'd, I'd started using Arundhati. So are you still Roy. Susie to old friends? You know, I have so many names that if somebody called me Rakesh or Suresh or something, I probably... You don't really know. mind what you're called, but you'd rather not be called Susie I've or called, Susanna. Yeah, I'm called that, but I'm called Roy by a lot of close friends. I'm called Nuni. I'm called... Okay, you Arundhati. wrote somewhere that your childhood was spent catching fish and learning to be quiet. Now, that sounds wonderfully evocative, but what does it mean? I, I uh, spent the earliest years, not the earliest, I was born in Shillong, but you know, my first sentient years, let's say, in, in Aymanam, the village in which the God of Small Things is set on the banks of a river. And uh, I had a sort of unsupervised childhood. You know, we were, my brother was five and I was four when my mother was divorced and we came back to this village. And uh, we used to spend a lot of time fishing uh, in the river and somehow normally protected children wouldn't, at that age would not be allowed to do that, you know. And, and so being four years old and sitting quietly waiting for that fish to bite, it was, uh, it was magical, you know, feeling of... Uh, I, I remember things that I thought when I was four years old. I actually remember it because... What they, sort of memories do you keep with you today? Uh, you know, it's very odd that the first thing that I ever wrote, the first coherent sentence that I ever wrote 
uh, is in The God of Small Things. And I wrote it when I was, I must have been five. What is the sentence? <laughs> it was about an Australian missionary who used to, whenever my mother wasn't around, she used to tell me that she could see Satan in my eyes. So I remember the first sentence was that I hate Miss Mitten and I think her knickers are torn. <laughs> yeah. You said that your parents were divorced when you were four or five. Did you have a happy childhood? Um, I had uh, moments of happiness in my childhood, yeah, but I wouldn't describe it as a happy one. It was a very um, intense one, but I wouldn't say happy. Did you have a lot of love as a child? Um, I had, uh, I think, you know, I had, I had two things. One, which is why you're always unsettled, you know, a lot of love, but also a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of not knowing what was going to happen to me tomorrow, which is, which is very unsettling for a child. And this was entirely because of the circumstances of marital discord within which you were growing up? No, I didn't grow up uh, in marital discord because, uh, you know, my parents were divorced when I must have been two or something. So there was no, there was an absence of... So where, where did the uncertainty and fear come from? Just being in a, you know, as I said, in this closed traditional society, you know, the child of a divorced mother. So your protector, your mother, is actually almost more vulnerable than you are. And all the prejudices of, of that society are, by, are being transmitted and radiated. And by as a her child, you almost felt you had to protect your mother. I, I, I know, it's not that I felt I had to protect her, but I was. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you don't know how to de you don't know where, uh, what is going to come, you know, as Esther says in the book, anything can happen to anyone. You had that sense of terrible fear and vulnerability to a world that you had no protection against. And even today, I can sense that you're not happy talking about it. It, it troubles you to talk about it. Yeah, I don't like to talk about my personal. Because it brings back those uncertainties. It brings back that fear. Yeah, partly that, but it's also partly because I, I don't like to just, you know, talk, you're cutting it talk off. about You're, you're pushing it into the background. It's over it's and done with. Not just that. It's not important, you know. It's not important for me to air my personal life to, you know. Okay, you left home at the age of 16. Did you feel as if you were being driven away or were you striking out on your own? No, I wasn't. Mm, it wasn't either of those things. It was just, um, I was just you know, I couldn't deal with what was happening to me at that time. So it was the easier option. In know, a sense, to, to save yourself, you had to leave. Yeah. You went and lived for a while in a squatter's colony in Delhi, amongst beggars, selling beer bottles, I believe, to make a living, empty beer bottles. What was that like? I was living initially uh, in Firo Shakotla, within the walls of the old fort. It was a little squatter colony. I was okay. It was... Uh, when you say it like this, it makes it sound tragic, but actually it wasn't. You know, there was a group of us, all of us were, you know, 16, 17, 18, um, studying were you rebels? Were you idealists? Were you running away from parents? What was, well, was that a common I was, I was, uh, you know, I was without a family. The others weren't. They, they had, you know, still their connection with the family, but all of us were very interested in what we were doing in college, interested in politics. You know, my whole, the whole beginning of The God of Small Things, the nuclear essay, Narmada Valley, it all started initially with architecture, you know, with trying to understand what I was studying And there. these were the years and you were also being an architectural student, That's you were learning right. it. Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, would you be correct in saying that the idealism, the fire, the passion was born at this time? It's, um, yeah, you know, beyond that, there's also there's also the humor. There's also the fact that you know, being 16 and 17 years old, being a, a a woman or a girl at that age who has had an education and or is getting an education, and yet you don't have these protections and these safety nets against this world, is a an amazing university to to learn in. You know, and so. That's where it comes from, I think, um, 
really experiencing the world without a safety net. You wrote somewhere that you wanted to negotiate with the world on your own terms, without parents, without uncles, without aunts. Was that what you were doing at that age? That's what I was doing, yeah. And there was laughter amidst the uncertainty? Because I imagine it must have been pretty uncertain. It was, but you know, when you're that young, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, there, 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 you don't have this sense of, at least I don't remember for a minute thinking, what will become of me? You know, I, I just knew that... You couldn't have cared less at the time <laughs> because the future <laughs> was, was ahead. Yeah, I know. It was just like, how am I going to, you know, pay my rent tomorrow? But I'll just make a mural or I'll just design a letterhead for someone or I'll just work in an office for, you know, at night or whatever it is. Okay, it was during these years, precarious but fun, that you met for the first time Pradeep Krishan. I gather he saw you on a bicycle. I was working at the National Institute of Urban Affairs, but living on my own in, in, in a Barsati in Nizamuddin, and I met Pradeep. You write somewhere that if you hadn't met him, you'd never have lived fully. Is he the anchor in your life today? Yeah, well, he is. He's, he's, uh, he's, um, I, I don't want to talk about, you know, what he means to me, but yeah, he's a, he's a great, um, I think, you know, he occupies all the intellectual spaces that I don't, you know, so it's a nice team. You're compatible. It's like, yeah, it's like I'm floating around somewhere up there and he's, you know... He's he, also given you the love, hasn't he, that perhaps as a yeah. child you never had, that you wanted but didn't get? I, I have to say that a lot of people have done that for me, you know. It, it, it is, uh, you know, I, I, I am at this point of time a very loved person, and I know that as well as the fact that I I do love many people. Okay, it was, is. it was sometime after you met Pradeep that you began writing. Well, you wrote first for films, scripts for television, scripts for movies, and then slowly, perhaps even without intending it, you began to work on your book. How did it start? Um, well, it started, of course, uh, when I met Pradeep, he was making Masi Sab. Uh, his first film and he just asked me to act in it and acting isn't something that I ever wanted to really do or nor do I want to act now but I knew that I would get a ringside seat into how a film is made and so I did Massey Sub and after I did it I, I realized that you know that's I mean it, it, it was never an accident my writing you know I knew ever since I was a child that this is what I want to do. Not ever since that sentence at the age of five. <laughs> oh yeah, and then on. But I never thought I'd ever get, you know, when you're 16 and 17 and you have no source of income other than what you earn on a precarious daily basis, then it seemed like I'd never make it. You know, I'd never be able to be a writer even though I wanted to, to try that out. But it didn't pan out that way. So after Masi Saab, I, uh, you know, I used to write so letters. Scripts, and he gives it those ones. I used to write letters to Pradeep, and I knew that one day he was going to write to me and say, I've never read writing like this. <laughs> and that's what happened. You know. So he gave you the confidence? He was, yeah, I mean, he, he was the person who, let's say, who opened the doors, you know, who made it possible that it, it seemed like a vi who made it seem like a viable option rather than just a, a dream. I'm going to at this point take a break, but I want to come back in part two and talk about your writing and also a little bit about that magic moment when you won the Booker Prize, but in fact you weren't in the room when it was announced. <laughs> yeah. But first we're going to take a break. See you in a moment. Don't go away. Welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is Arundhati Roy. Arundhati, we paused at the end of part one at that very moment when you're going to win the Booker Prize. On that particular moment when the announcement was happening, I gather you weren't even in the room. Is that right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. I was uh, out. I'd gone, you know, I'd gone to the loo and, and uh, someone was like banging on the door saying, you know, they're announcing it. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> what took you to the loo? Were you nervous? No. I was I was nervous, but that's not what took me to the loo. I was I, I have to say that you know I, I didn't enjoy the episode. I enjoyed I, I you know of course I, I enjoyed the fact that I won the Booker Prize. But while it was happening, there was something quite humiliating about the whole thing. You know the uh, being in competition. 
being in competition, you know, I, I wrote this book for Estepin and Rahel and Amu and, you know, suddenly it was like uh, I was, you know, I didn't want to want that prize, but I had started wanting it because of the kind of pressures that are being put on you. The so kind you were of, beginning to become yeah. a little angry with yourself as well, suddenly. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was sad that I, I wanted to win it, you know. I thought I was bigger than that. Okay, tell me, today you are probably one of India's best-known authors, certainly one of the most widely read. What does your writing mean to you? Does it define you? Let's say that it's, um, there's nothing that, there's nothing that pleases me more than, than a beautiful sentence, you know. I could go out and come home carrying a sentence in my head like other people bring shopping in, you know. So it is something that, um, satisfies me because it's, I've said this before, but that language is the skin on my thought. The, it's the way I think, you know, and it's a great, it's a great privilege to be given that space to think. And that, that I feel is, is the real privilege that I have earned, you know. The, the language and the thought are very clear and very mm. obvious in The God of Small Things. But what about some of your activist writing? Mm. I take it that's not spontaneous, that doesn't just come into your head, that's researched and sweated over. Yeah, well, <coughs> also The God of Small Things wasn't spontaneous, you know, it's a very crafted novel, you know, the language is spontaneous, but when I say but language... the structure is not. Yeah, the structure is not. In the, in the end of imagination, it was a moral position, you know, it was my moral position on the nuclear test. In the greater common good, instinct took me to the Narmada Valley, but I was very aware that this is a subject one needs to learn about before you write about it. Let's, let's talk a little about those two essays. Mm -hmm. In The End of Imagination, people say that her heart's in the right place, her motivations are pure, but she doesn't know what she's talking about. Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, you have, how do you argue with a, a moral position? You know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind if every country in the world had a nuclear bomb. You know, I'm not talking about defense strategy. So if you want to talk about it in those terms, you can say she doesn't know what she's talking about. But I'm a unilateralist on that score. In the Narmada Valley is a different thing. You can't take a moral position on a big dam. You know, you have to, and I don't, I didn't have a moral position. I was curious about let it. Me, let me, let me push this a little. For mm. instance, let's go back to the end of imagination, the essay on the bond. People say that it was full of passion and emotion, but lacking in analytical content. Like candy floss, it tantalized only to disappoint. Well, I think people are very scared of passion and emotion, you know. It's like something that people don't want to address. But I, I can't argue uh, such a general point, you know, somebody just dismisses you like, oh, it's full of emotion, but, you know, as if there's something criminal about emotion. I, I, and this is something that's happening more and more, you know. And you, in fact, were deliberately making an emotional course, statement. Of course. That was the point of it. You know, I, I believe in emotion, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, so, uh, I'm so sad that people are so suspicious of emotion. Even when you, I mean, and in a way I understand it, when you live in this country, you have to deaden your emotion to carry on living, to carry on dealing with what you see on the street. Okay, let's, let's switch to the other essay, because there it wasn't emotion that people criticize, there it's the fact that you've taken your critique to find lost credibility. For instance, you write, people stop growing things they can afford to eat, and start growing things they can only afford to sell. Mm. By linking themselves to the market, they lose control over their lives, and then later on you say, they get yoked to the whims of a world they know nothing about. It sounds almost as if you're glorifying some sort of concept of a noble savage, yeah, that, yeah. You're, that you're worshipping an Arcadian ignorance without accepting or admitting that it's backward, it's poor, it's impoverished, it's self-denying. Let me say this, that I uh, have I, when I went to the valley, I went to these villages, I have no doubt in my mind, and nobody should have any doubt in, in their minds, that these are very poor people that are being displaced. You know, but this idea that it's a noble, this noble savage, particularly this term, it is offensive, you know, to me, because it's the sort of government line that you're actually trying to say that we are displacing people for their own good, you know, that we're taking them away and giving them development. Now, this is, this is 
the most, I mean, it's, it's insulting. It's them. Big Brother. We know better for them it's, than they yeah, know for I themselves. Yeah, I mean, look at this. Here you're talking about these villages like Neem Gawan and Jal Sindhi. Go there and see. You know, these are poor people, but they are self-sufficient. You know, they have fish. But you see, your they have argument to, no, doesn't... No, let me, let me just finish. And uh, when, you, when you take them away from that and dump them somewhere else, smash their community links, you know, they have no land, you give them some money, and you call this development. If they were so interested in development or developing these people, why for the last 50 years was there not a single road, not a single school, not a single well? But you see, Arundhati, that's a, a very fair point that many would accept, but then you go further and that's mm. when the danger comes. You go on to argue that dams per se are a threat to democracy. And that's the point at which people okay. say, she's exaggerating. Okay, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I meant by that. That we have 3,600 3, big dams in India. They are the, we're the third biggest dam builders. And what I mean when I say there are, I don't say that they are a threat to democracy, but what I say is that what these dams have done is to take natural resources away from the countryside to the cities. So yes, they've produced electricity, but 80% of rural households have no electricity. 250 million have no drinking water. 350 million live below the poverty line. Do you think line. you overstated your case? Do you no. think you used language that have misled people? No. no? I, 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 have, I stand by every single thing I said in this. Every single thing. And, I, and I only want to say that, you know, it's, it's the saddest thing about this debate is there comes a point at which argument stops and untruths bega begin to filter in, you know, and that's why I wish Your critics people... are hitting you back with untruth, you're saying? Yeah, with untruth. Is there not a danger here that the response to Arundhati, the activist, could begin to affect the respect, perhaps even the admiration for Arundhati, the author? Doesn't that worry you? It doesn't worry me, because this is not about Arundhati, you know, this is not about me at all. I'm not playing for you know, brownie points here. You're part of a bigger cause. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's like, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not interested in a character certificate from people telling me what I should write, what I shouldn't, who respects me, who doesn't. You know, I've got the t-shirt, i got everything that I could have possibly You're wanted. You're saying, this is me, writer. accept me as I am. No, Because I'm not going to change to please you. Or don't. I mean, it's not about my soliciting any mm. kind of public, uh, uh, support. I mean, uh, you know, of myself. I am somebody who wants to say what I want to say, you know, and I'm willing for people to argue with me, but not, you know, try and give me marks about what I'm like. Arundhati, long may you continue to say what you say and say it as well as you do. Thank you very much for coming Thank to you. the studio.